Hi, I'm Jamie Poisson, host of Front Burner, the CBC's daily news podcast. This is the first pandemic caused by a coronavirus. The involvement that I'd had uh, should have had me remove myself from those discussions. Every weekday morning, we bring you one important story in depth and detail, and we do it in about 20 minutes. Of course, we cover a lot of Canadian news, but there's a whole world out there, and we bring you those stories too. You can subscribe to FrontBurner wherever you get your podcasts or get FrontBurner on the CBC Listen app. This is a CBC Podcast. Say Anin, Buju, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today on Radio Indigenous. My mom had just recently retired and wasn't really doing, you know, like a lot of things to occupy her time. So when I would go over and visit, uh, I would bring all my sewing with me and um, I'd say, here, try this, sew this or whatever. And she started doing small little crafty things, like little tiny uh, moccasins. It was really difficult when I was beating the first time because I've never beat in my life. I saw my mom beating before when I was growing up and that, but I was never interested in it. But I felt amazed when I finished my <laughs> moccasin. <laughs> My Mi'kmaq identity is expressed through my quill work because I had grown up hearing a lot of stories from my elders, you know, they make baskets, we're out in the woods a lot, but this was the first thing that I did that really just flowed through me. I've found my identity through quillin. I was not connected to my culture, to really anything until I started to quill. Meet some Indigenous people who are crafting culture back into their family and community circles. Indigenous people who relearn traditional crafts like beadwork or making mitts and moccasins are sewing pieces of their culture back, one stitch at a time. Al Yaput is an Ojibwe Cree two-spirit artist based in Thunder Bay who makes everything from ribbon skirts to mukleks. He teaches moccasin-making workshops, and recently he had a very special student, his mom, Madeline. Ali, Madeline, welcome to the show. Uh, bonjour, miigwech. So, Ali, when did you first learn how to make traditional crafts? Oh, my God, it's probably since birth. <laughs> um, I, I, I was wa- raised by my grandparents. So, um, you know, being with my grandmother a lot and just watching, like, um, what she did, you know, like, in her spare time and stuff and, you know, just, like, watching, so... Watching is learning, and then that's basically kind of like how a lot of uh, First Nations people learn from the beginning. Mm-hmm. I remember watching my uh, mom make moccasins, and I was just was so amazed at how she seemed like it was magic. What do you remember about those times with your grandmother? Um, just like the closeness, and you know, like there wasn't like a lot of formal like teachings, right? You just basically, like I mentioned earlier, you just watched, and uh, you know, like sitting in silence or you know just kind of like listening to her hum while she worked and stuff and me of course you know sitting by her side just like watching playing a lot of my time was spent with my grandmother so like we had that really really close connection whatever she did uh i pretty much learned how to do and when did you when did you decide to pick up the uh the beads and needles oh my goodness um I think that I first started crafting when I was like in high school. I think I was like already like 17. So that was a good 30 something years ago. Um, We'll say (laughs) it. Yeah, so a good 30 30 years already. You know, just starting like with basic crafts, um, just doing like earrings and and dream catchers, Mm -hmm. beginner crafts, and then um, kind of just like, uh, doing stuff for myself and, you know, just kind of like remembering the process of how, you know, you would put together like leather into footwear. 
I guess you could say uh, blood memory, right? Mm -hmm. It's something you don't forget completely. It's there, you um, you feel inspired and or uh, something will trigger you and you say, hey, I know how to do this. And so that's how that kind of came about. I had my beginning long, long time ago. <laughs> what do you love about, about making moccasins and other crafts? Creating something beautiful from just, you know, like, simple things like a bead can be so tiny but when like put together with other beads you know it just like grows and blossoms into something beautiful I just like um my quiet time usually um I'll do like my sewing or crafting really early in the morning because I get up pretty early so I usually have a few hours before I go and do like you know go to my day job and how did you start to uh teach your mom Uh, I lived in Winnipeg for a number of years so about four, four or five years ago, my uh, my aunt, my aunt slash sister, who I had grown up with, uh, ended up with cancer. Mm. Um, she eventually passed away after her short battle, and then I just, I decided to leave Winnipeg, and oh, I came home. <laughs> mm. Yeah. So that was hard. That was yeah. hard. Uh, my mom had just. Um, recently retired and wasn't really doing, you know, like a lot of things to occupy her time. So when I would go over and visit, uh, I would bring all my sewing with me and um, I'd say, here, try this, try this though, sew this or whatever. And she started doing small little crafty things like little ornaments or she would like make little tiny uh, moccasins. And um, I was contacted by a woman, Give me cash and a cousin. I don't remember her name. But anyways, um, she actually lives here in the city. And um, she had messaged me and, and contacted me and asked if I would be interested in hosting a workshop for residential school survivors, which my mom is. She went to Macintosh, which is just outside of Kenora. So with a little bit of planning, uh, we were able to do a workshop with a small group of other survivors and youth. So it was uh, elders and youth moccasin making workshop. And Madeline, what do you remember from that first class with Allie? Oh, yeah, I remember it pretty well. It was a very nervous uh, day for me when I first went because uh, I have never done any sewing like in live with other people before and that but uh, it was a really good experience and cutting up the letter and curve and and it's me like so. how do I sew this? Yeah I'm getting it I was sewing with the needles and uh, at first, when I first started, I used two needles at a time, and I didn't, uh, it was really difficult mm-hmm. when I was beating the first time, because I've never beat in my life. I saw my mom beating before when I was going up and that, but I was never interested in it, because uh, I had a lot of problems in my life. My, my, my time when I was going up and but what the first workshop I wanted was, I felt amazed when I finished my <laughs> magazine. <laughs> it was a challenging experience, really. And from there, I went on and I kept going and I'm still beating today. Mm-hmm. So I get orders. And what was Allie like as a teacher? Oh my God, if I recommend somebody, would I mean, be number one? <laughs> really she's only good. saying that because yeah. she's my mom. <laughs> yeah. I am so grateful that I, got, I learned from him because he, he's a very patient person when he does his work. And, uh, and then there are really pretty good, uh, clear ways what he does and things like that. And it's a good way for everybody that does that. that didn't know that doesn't know how to do any work like um, models and some stuff like that. That he would <laughs> he would give the right way. So. Why did you want to learn? 
Well, I see my the mother working on uh, Morgan's series, and I was not really interested in doing uh, work before, but I think it's because it keeps me uh, busy mm. and um, keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> my mom is not a bad person. <laughs> It's a lot of challenge, you know, when you do bid work. Well, I think she's doing all right. She's, uh, like I said, she, she has a, like a small following on Facebook and she does get orders, so. <laughs> You're listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. I'm speaking with Ali Yaput, an Ojibwe Cree artist. He recently taught his mother, Madeline, a residential school survivor, how to do beadwork. These are skills that are usually passed down through the generations, Allie, but you're passing them up. Why are you doing that? Well, for one thing, our, our family, like our bond, me and my mom, and we've gotten like to be really, really close. You know, because we, we just sit together when I go and visit and then we sew, so... Um, and it's actually, you know, it's it's helping me relearn my language again, right? Um, when I'm um, over at my mom's house, there's very little English. Like, I'm not really fluent, like fluent, but I can understand really, really well. So um, I'm I'm still kind of a little shy when it comes to speaking, but you know, like I'll try when I'm with my mom. But sometimes it's hard when she doesn't have her hearing aids in. <laughs> And it's really kind of difficult for me also to try to learn my own language, you know, and to say things like, and if I speak something like uh, no Ojibwe, the way a lot of people talk, I would speak uh, halfway of it and then English the rest of the way. Sometimes he would ask me the words that, uh, how you say these things, or yeah. how do you spell it, and stuff like that, and I get stuck. Because I lost a lot of language when I was going to residential school, and it's not something that yeah that uh, I didn't uh, want to leave with, the, you know, when I left my reserve. And it was really pretty hard to speak your language when you were over there and when I was over there. And, yeah. and then learning a little bit after I came home, you know, listening to my mother, what they're speaking in an Ojibwe. And I've learned a lot. Um, mm-hmm. What is it like when you, when you get to sit down together and sew? Do you butt heads? Are your sewing and beating sessions full of laughter? Um, I don't. My mom talks more than I do. I just go, uh-huh. mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like um, the time passes so like by so quickly. Like a day will just shoot right by, and mm. um, yeah, sometimes we we will just sit there and just you know work in well, not really work in silence, but you know we just enjoy each other's company so um my mom lives on way on the other side of the city so i don't get to go there a lot um i work so i i try my best to be there on my days off just to keep my mom company (laughs) yeah you mentioned earlier that it has brought you closer how has this changed your relationship with your mom (gasps) oh since the lockdown like we have had such a very very difficult time at the beginning of i guess the covid lockdowns i we lost my mom lost her baby i lost my baby sister uh in a car accident so um you know just being there for each other um and then uh, a couple more other family members passed away too so our family unit here in Thunder Bay is pretty, really, really small. There's just me and my mother. Uh, My sister lives in Constant Lake. She actually has started picking up the craft as well. And her daughters too, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. (sighs) Oh, that's beautiful. And now that people want you to make stuff for them, how does that feel to 
to know that people want your work. How does that make you feel when I you take good. orders? I feel good. I want to say yes. <laughs> I can't say no to anybody. It makes me feel good when I make something for people. It's not mm. about the money. It's about how you make things, you know, and, and you can accomplish with something for somebody. You know, when uh, they'll, they'll wear my uh, stuff that I made for them, you know, and that's what makes me feel good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to take one of your classes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'll have to take one of Madeline's classes. Yeah, you know what? I was kind of like thinking about that today. You know what? Um, that would be like amazing if my mom, probably not right away, but I, you know, she probably can if she wanted to, right? Anybody can do whatever they want, you know, if they just try it. So Yeah. What's your favorite part of, of bead working with your son? It's good. Yeah. Yeah, it's good. I learned it. <laughs> but you know what? I still ask him about uh, about cutting the fur and stuff like that. What size I'm supposed to be putting on the mouth and stuff. <laughs> My brain sometimes doesn't work. So does does crafting and beadwork make you feel connected to your to your mother and your aunties? You know what to tell the truth about that something about what you just said about my son or crafting and things like I think only a few times I saw my mother's son with her beadwork and things like that, what she was making. And but Mostly, I saw her was uh, what she made her little uh, snowshoes. 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 She was a snowshoe maker, uh, and uh, that's that's the thing that I saw her most mostly doing. But uh, just once, once or twice, maybe that I've seen her do the beadwork. And but mm-hmm. yeah, uh, if I would have learned. A lot of things from my mom with her crafts and that. I would have, I would have taken it, mm-hmm. but I was bad too because of too <laughs> many, too many things in my head. You know, after coming back from over there, you know that I went to school and you know, and it was a lot yeah. that I didn't care about anything because of the way I felt and stuff like that. So, but today. I feel good every day. I'm learning everything every day with something new. <laughs> Allie, Madeline, thank you so much for speaking with me today. So, miigwech, yes, from the bottom of my heart, I was so touched that, you know, like, um, you invited me to be a guest on your show. And my mom, like, this journey for us isn't over yet. So we'll still be sewing together. <laughs> it's a good journey. Yeah. <laughs> We're not going to stop. Ali Yaput is an Ojibwe Cree artist. We reached him and his mom, Madeline, in Thunder Bay. She's so cute. take this moment to acknowledge the passing of Stalo writer, rebel, and grandmother of story, Lee Miracle. Lee went home to her ancestors on November 11th. She was 71. She was many things to many people. An unapologetic storyteller, mentor, pathmaker, matriarch, mother. But above all, Lee Miracle was loved. Next week, the Unreserved team is creating an hour-long tribute to Lee. We'll hear from Indigenous writers whose lives she touched. We'll also share an extended conversation I had with Lee in 2018, some previously unaired. 
She talks about her rise in the literary industry after the release of Bobby Lee, Indian Rebel, in 1975. About how she stormed stages and reclaimed space and story. And Lee reminds us that no one really leaves us. We don't see a difference between the world of the dead and the world of the living. The dead miss us too. We don't just miss them, but they're missing us, and they're always watching us. And my mother used to say that. She'd say, oh, well, you know, indigenous people don't have, you know, fantasy on the one hand and reality on the other. You know, our dead are right here. They're listening to us. They're all around us, and they're caretaking us. next week on Unreserved. We hope you can join us for this special tribute to the great Lee Miracle. I'm Jeremy Rat. I'm half Indigenous and half white. Pieces is an all-new CBC British Columbia original podcast. This is a story of being stuck between two worlds, not really fitting in with either of them. So because I don't have darker skin or long brown hair, that therefore I was not Indigenous. You don't have to be a residential school survivor yourself to be traumatized by residential school. Pieces. Listen to it now, wherever you get your podcasts. You're listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Today, crafting culture back into Indigenous communities. Porcupine quilling is a traditional Indigenous art form. It involves softening and dyeing porcupine quills and weaving them into designs on birch bark. It is an intricate and painstaking work. Mi'kmaq people have been making quill art for generations. Cheryl Simon and Kay Sark are artists from Ebequit, or Prince Edward Island. Not only has this art form helped them find their way to culture, they also share their knowledge on a podcast. And as the CBC's Isabel Glant tells us, the Ebequit Quill Sisters are finding meaning and helping to build identity through their quilling. Yeah, that looks really good. See how this is coming off? See how that is coming off? That's really good growth. We turn to the, there's nothing wrong with that tree. It's a muggy August day, and I'm walking on a wooded path in Lenox Island, PEI, with Cheryl Simon and Kay Sark. Mosquitoes swarm around us and settle on our bare skin. So it's a really good sign to see the scabs starting to dry off and, and come away that way, because it's the trees in the final stages of getting back to the regular white bark. It's like it's coming off in patches. Yeah. I love seeing this. It's a good job, tree. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl and Kay are friends. They're Mi'kmaq porcupine quill artists from PEI. They've walked this path many times because of the birch trees that grow in these woods. So we're looking right now at three trees, three birch trees that are pretty close together that have been harvested. And it's been about five years since they were harvested. So the scab on them has just about completely come off and the tree has healed itself. So next year it will probably have a layer of white bark on it again. And then after that grows, you won't even be be able to tell the difference between the trees that were harvested and those that weren't from a distance. Birch bark is an integral part of Mi'kmaq quill art. It forms the canvas that the porcupine quills are inserted into. Birch bark harvesting season is over for the year. It usually happens in July, when the fireflies first appear. Cheryl and Kay are here to check up on trees they've harvested from in the past to make sure they're healing well. As we walk down the path, we see birch trees with large black patches where bark has been peeled off. Oh, that's so nice. Kay first came to these woods with Cheryl when she was first learning how to quill five years ago. 
I seen bark being harvested before I actually did it myself. I was with Cheryl and another one of her apprentices. We were on this trail, I'm pretty sure, mm -hmm. but it was a different spot. And I was able to touch the bark and all this stuff. And then the year after is when I started. So I harvested my first piece on this trail. Not only is birch bark the foundation of Mi'kmaq quill work, it's what literally keeps the piece of art from falling apart. So the, so the birch bark, right, we, we harvested in the summer when the tree is actually already starting to prepare to go dormant. And what happens is, is that the paper birch has a lot of really extremely thin layers to the bark. And when it starts to move its water down to the roots, the sugar water, it fuses all of those layers of bark together. So we peel it off during that stage of the yearly cycle and we use it to put the porcupine quills in because if you poke a hole in it, it will start to close up almost immediately and that's what holds the quills in. But it's really cool to see these trees healing. Yeah. It's like coming back to see old friends. <laughs> <laughs> this is where it all started. <laughs> Harvesting birch bark and using it in quill work is one of the topics Cheryl and Kay explore in their podcast, Ebiguit Quill Sisters. Ebiguit is what the Mi'kmaq call PEI. They put out their first episode last May and have released more than a dozen since then. Welcome to Ebiguit Quill Sisters, where Mi'kmaq porcupine quill workers share the stories behind their art. That sound in the podcast intro is the call of the porcupine, or maduas, in Mi'kmaq. Cheryl and Kay started the podcast to share how they create their quill work, the same way generations of Mi'kmaq before them did. Here's a bit from the second episode about porcupine quills. So what we're, of course, always interested in are their quills, because mm -hmm. each porcupine has about 30,000 quills that are on them. And what, like, what do people always ask you about quills? That it must be crazy when they shoot their quills. Yeah, I hear that a lot I'm about like, people they, too. They won't shoot their quills. I'm thinking maybe that might have come from like when they're running or where they're moving, they fall out or something. So <laughs> the reason why they don't shoot them is because quills are actually a mutated hair. And so I always tell people, you know, when you brush your hair and some of the strands come out, that's kind of what it's like for the porcupine. I think a starting point for a lot of the topics was actually just the common questions we've heard from people over the years. You know, how do we gather our materials? What's it like? Where do you get them? What do you have to do with them? So if you listen to the podcast, it actually starts from the beginning with the raw materials, how we got into quill work, and then moves on into other topics as we kind of move along in the process of quilling. After our walk in the woods, we get back in the car and drive to Kay's house a few minutes away. On her back deck, there's a cardboard box with flies buzzing around it. I'm about to witness another integral part of Mi'kmaq quill art, the porcupine itself. So Cheryl messaged me on her way here this morning. She's like, I got you a present. And I was like, is it roadkill? And she <laughs> said yes. Porcupine quills are hard to come by here in PEI. That's because there are no porcupines on the island. Quillers here have to go to New Brunswick or Nova Scotia to find them. They don't like to harm the animals, so they try to find porcupines that have been hit by a car on the side of the highway. That's right, they gather roadkill. Cheryl drove to PEI from her home in Nova Scotia earlier today. She found this porcupine in New Brunswick, along the highway as she approached the Confederation Bridge. Did you see its paws, about Like yeah, what we're talking, yeah. Isn't it cute though? Like just ignore what it is, but it's like, it's a really cute animal. I was doing it the other night, I was like, Mi'kma'ki, the traditional territory of the Mi'kmaq, stretches from present-day Newfoundland down to Maine. Within that territory, none of the islands are home to porcupines, not PEI, Newfoundland, or Cape Breton. So Mi'kmaq people have always had to bring quills wherever they were going to be quilling, whether it was the other islands or not. So that's something that we do, that our ancestors have been doing for centuries as well. Traditionally, the Mi'kmaq depended on the land to survive. That means they traveled a lot throughout Mi'kma'ki. Those who lived on PEI, or Ebiquit, often made the voyage by canoe across the Northumberland Strait to the area of Nova Scotia now known as Picto, or in Mi'kmaq, Piktuk. So they had easy access to porcupine quills on the mainland. They moved back and forth so much that the two areas are known as one district, Ebiquit Ach Piktuk. It's one of the seven districts within Mi'kmaq. Kay starts pulling the quills off the porcupine. So to me, I feel like it's like picking grass.
So you can't take a whole lot or you're not going to be able to do it. I will always remember the first porcupine that I ever dequilled. As I was lifting it up to get the quills out, it was kind of like a... And I was like, this thing is breathing! I backed away from it and I was scarred. I yep. So funny. <laughs> it's like five years later, that still cracks yeah, me up. I still think of it when I'm dequilling. And then we like to get these ones here by the shoulders. Those are usually the ones that are a good size for the quilling. So each porcupine's got about 30,000 quills. So it's better to have probably about an inch, inch and a half, and then quite narrow quills. Those are the ones we like the most. Usually I'm out here, I have my hair in a high bun, and I'm just <laughs> chilling out here at my roadkill. People will stop by, though, to take a look and be like, what are you doing? And I have no problem being like, this is what I'm doing, this is how I do it. Like, yeah. Did you want to yeah, try it? Right, yeah. Okay. I pull on a yellow rubber glove and look into the box. The porcupine is missing its head. You can see the red, bloody spinal cord sticking out of one end. Kay and Cheryl show me how to pull the quills, not too hard, and how many to grasp between my fingers. The quills make a slight squelching sound as they pull away from the porcupine's skin. I tell Cheryl and Kay it's hard to believe the quills I'm pulling off this dead animal will be transformed into the kind of stunning, colorful quill art that I've seen hanging in museums. If you've never seen quill art, it can be hard to imagine. Most Mi'kmaq quill work is intricate. Rows of quills, dyed different colors, nestle up against each other to create the designs. Traditional Mi'kmaq quill work is geometric and abstract, sometimes forming stars, chevrons, and other shapes. Some contemporary quill artists create animals and plants with the quills. In some designs, the birch bark shows through in the background. In others, quills cover the entire surface. The art often has sweet grass woven around the edge to give it a finished look, and sometimes it's also framed. Most of the work Kay and Cheryl make is either commissioned or for gallery exhibits. The process of getting from this dead porcupine to the finished art is detailed and time-consuming. And then once you've got the quills off, you have to sort out the fur from the guard hair. Because like, if you look at this, you can see that there's small little hairs. These ones that are right here. Then there's hair, like hairy hair, <laughs> in through here. And then there's all different sizes of quills. Yeah. yeah. The quills then need to be washed. It can take up to a week to dry them. The quills are naturally white with a black tip, but they're usually dyed different colors. That's all just preparing your materials to begin your piece of quill art. So to start a piece, we usually start on graph paper, which could take upwards to a couple hours to design. And that's just the first step to and then to get it onto the bark and then to sort through all these quills, all the colors, okay. everything like that. It could take hours and hours before you even get to start quilling. Mm -hmm. And then it takes hours to do a quill piece. Okay. Some of the bigger ones can take almost a week of effort yeah. as you go along with it, especially if it's intricate. And yeah. it's funny because we always used to talk about the length of time it takes to make quill work based on our human activity. Yeah. And on the podcast, my son pointed out that we also have to account for the time it takes the tree to grow. So we used to just say that it would take several weeks or a month or so to make a piece of quill work. Now we say it takes that plus 60 years. Cheryl is mostly a self-taught quiller. She spent two years in her 20s learning on her own talking to elders and other people who knew about the materials involved. My first pieces of quill work are horrible. <laughs> <laughs> My sister loves to tease me about the quality of them. Um, I think more enthusiasm than skill at the beginning because it was really learning about the type of quills to use and, and how to do the design so that they're aesthetically pleasing. Because um, you, you can see a picture of what our ancestors used to do, but trying to emulate it, of course, they were so skilled that it takes a long time for my skill level to reach the point where it really looked good, and I was thoroughly proud of the piece. <laughs> Cheryl later passed on all of her knowledge to Kay during an apprenticeship program on Lenox Island in 2016. I remember when we were looking for people to become an apprentice because Kay was one of the people that had been almost targeted, if you will, um, yeah. for selection because the fact that she was used to using her hands. She did a lot of beadwork. She was doing different crafts. So to have that type of fine motor skill and the mentality to sit there for hours, we thought that she would actually make a really good apprentice. I was interested in the quilling part, not everything that you have to do to get to the point of quilling. So I'm so happy and thankful she thought she taught me how to quill before she 
brought the dead animals in and the whole woods and bugs and stuff. So after that first summer, like, do you, would you say you were pretty much hooked at that point? Oh, yes, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I kept going since then. It's been five years. So why go to all this work? Why spend hours upon hours to create this art? For Cheryl and Kay, it's not just about the satisfaction of creating something beautiful. It's also a huge part of who they are as Mi'kmaq women. I've found my identity through Quillen. I was not connected to my culture, to really anything until I started to quill and I got out into the woods and I was connecting with nature and with animals. Then it, it was there. As a mom too, like just to be able to teach my kids things that I'd, I've never known, I've never learned. I've learned most of it from Cheryl, <laughs> but it, it feels good to be able to teach them that it, it's who you are as a Mi'kmaq person. It's okay to be that person. It's, it's not something you should hide. And I think my, my Mi'kmaq identity is expressed through my quill work because I had grown up hearing a lot of stories from my elders, you know, they make baskets, we're out in the woods a lot, but this was the first thing that I did that really just flowed through me. It was such an expression of who I am and it ties together my connection with the land. And I absolutely love it because it keeps me out harvesting, I'm out exercising my rights, and it's just to me, it's the epitome of being Mi'kmaq when I'm doing my quill work. Well, when I was learning, me and Cheryl, we would quilt together all day, every day. Cheryl and Kay sit together at Kay's kitchen table. They're quilling eight-pointed Mi'kmaq stars onto small circles of birch bark. The eight-pointed star is a Mi'kmaq symbol that has been used for centuries. So right now, I am transferring the design onto the piece of birch bark, which is going to be an eight-pointed star. And what, what's this tool that you're using? This is just an awl. So you know how when you have earrings, when you've had the holes in your ears for quite some time, they'll kind of start to grow over? So they'll close up, but you'll still be able to see where the holes are. So that's what will happen with this as time goes on. It'll just close up and we won't be able to put the quills in, it won't fit. So when it comes time to do the quilling, you have to actually put the holes in that you're going to be needing. The quills are floating in a bowl of water. They need to be soaked until pliable in order to be woven into the bark. And the quills actually aren't very strong, so if you don't have them soaked well enough, they'll just break on you. And you have to be careful when you're cleaning them, because if you bend them or anything... Oh, see that one there? There was a weakness there. So you have to take it out and redo it. They use tweezers to thread the quills into the holes they've poked in the bark. So I like to put two in at a time, and then that way you know they match. So you can put two quills in one hole, but if you do more than that, you risk having them pop out. So as long as that there's enough at the back for it to go through and hold, then you can just trim it flush. And you trim as you go? Yes, otherwise you risk getting yourself poked by the quills. Oh, yes. So you always put the black end into that hole and then pull it up so you don't see the black anymore and then fold it over. It's just so intricate, even this very, very simple design. Yeah. And these are the bits that our children always laugh about getting stuck in their socks and things like that. <laughs> yeah. Kay and Cheryl are both mothers, and they're both teaching their children how to quill. Passing on this tradition is an important aspect of their art. They talked about that on their podcast, and during one episode, their kids join them. So, okay. Carolyn, what else do you want to learn? Like, now that you've done a star, what other type of quill work do you want to be making? I want to be making, like, like the ones you make. The ones with all the fill, right? Yeah, the ones with the fill and the crisscross, like, and the, the ones with the quill works and then the quill works on top. Oh, the overlay? Yeah, the overlay. Riley, have you ever done overlay with your quill work? Um, I honestly don't know. I don't think he has. I know he's done, like, the outlines and stuff. I don't think he's done the fill yet. 
would you be interested in doing the fill? Like filling in all the um, empty spots? Yeah, like for if you do a star, you feel like fill the star in or, yeah? Yeah, I'd like to do it. We'll have to work on it. Yeah. Let me teach you the ways, son. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think about all the generations of parents who didn't have the opportunity to teach their children their culture when they were safe, when they could be proud of it, when it was a positive thing. Um, there was a lot of times, I'm even getting emotional thinking about this, um, even live with my grandparents where there was components of our culture that couldn't be shared, that had to be actively hidden from people. So to be able to teach my children that they only know the positive of their Mi'kmaq identity, and that is something that means more than I can express. Quilling, it, it involves my whole family now. Like, we're always together. We always go bark harvesting together we go get our porcupines together we get our sweet grass together it's just all of us so like she said it's it's nothing but positive experiences for them where I didn't even have a experience when I was younger so for them to have all of this it's normal for them to walk out of their room and see bark and quills and mom outside de a porcupine and <laughs> it's just it's natural for them it's it's the way yeah. it should be yeah it is Did you know that I didn't learn anything about Mi'kmaq culture the whole time I was in school? What? I know. Wait, actually? Yeah, Riley, I actually didn't learn anything about anything Indigenous until I went to university when I was at school. Jeez. I know. And like even now? then, I've never, none of my classes, when I was learning about stuff about Indigenous people, none of it was about Mi'kmaq people. Jeez. And now, so, like, we learn a, bun a bunch of stuff. It's cool. Yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I like going in to talk with classes, because, like, you guys are learning about it when you're little, but I had to be in my 20s before I even wanted to talk to people about it. Yeah. I wasn't, it wasn't until my adult life, like, just a few years back, that I started embracing anything traditional or anything to do with Mi'kmaq culture. That's why with Riley and Kira, when I see you guys harvesting bark or doing quill work or anything like that, like embracing anything, it really it, it touches my heart. They're even starting to, when they're, when they're teaching. My kids are 10 and 11. Um, they've done quill work before, and just recently my son was in the Eptech Center in Summerside. He had a quill piece in there, and he was so proud of it. So I went to his class, and I taught all of those kids how to do an eight-pointed star. And for them to just pick it up and be so natural with it, I left that day. I was in tears because I was just so proud of all these kids. And my son was up helping everybody with anything. Like, he's like, you do it like this. You put it in here. You you tie it. And I'm like, he does know. <laughs> like, he pays attention to what I'm doing at home. It was really nice. My daughter, who's the youngest one, she loves quill work. She absolutely loves it. She wants to make pieces. She's extremely excited that she's going to be in a show with me, one of her pieces. My son, he likes quill work, but he's not as drawn to it as my daughter is. What he is really drawn to is actually working more with the bark and spruce root. So I think with him, it's more about, you know, learning the science behind the spruce roots, how they, how the trees use the fungus to talk to each other. That's the part that he's fascinated by. But I think maybe making bowls and some of the Mi'kmaq toys, he likes that more than quill work. And that's fine because I'm trying to learn more skills as well. That way when he finds what he really likes, then he'll be able to keep, continue on with it. I think the way that my children are learning quill work is more natural. It's something that they started when they were babies being around. I have pictures of my son with a teether that was birch bark. Um, not on purpose, but he was using it and gnawing <laughs> on it because he was always with me. You know, when they, when they were babies, they got used to being carried by me and bending over and picking medicines and harvesting and stuff. So I think that as they've grown up, they have come into and aged into the different stages of quill work. And that is definitely more natural than doing it as an adult when you're starting from scratch. And so for me, how Mi'kmaq people teach their children is what Kay and I are able to demonstrate. We didn't have the benefit of that with quill work when we were younger. Um, and I, I think that is the type of activity that's going to have to happen more in order for, you know, true reconciliation to happen. Um, people are going to have to be able to actively teach their children their entire lives something that they need to know about their culture.
Cheryl and Kay are exploring all of these issues on their podcast, not only how they create their art, but why they're passing it on. They also interview family members and other quill artists. People in six countries and 65 different cities are listening to their podcast. So Declan, do you remember when you harvested your first birch tree? I do not remember, but I do remember another time. Which time do you remember, bud? Well, when we were by Grammy's house, like we were by there and we harvested a bit of birch bark. Did you know that watching you harvest birch bark almost made me cry because I was so happy about it? No. It's true because when I was a little girl, I never got to learn how to do it. I had to wait till I was all grown up to do it. So when I was watching you, it really, really made me happy. And Carolyn, did you know that this year, because you are now seven years old, that this season you're going to be old enough to be able to harvest birch bark? I'm going to say I'm happy. <laughs> so why are you excited? I'm excited. About- How come? Because I've never done it before. Yeah, and see, you've been you've been cooking more this year, haven't you? Yes. And I think that you're old enough now that you'll be able to do it without hurting the tree. Yes, yes, yes. I think what I like about the podcast evolution is that we started out with some very surface level things that we wanted to share. You know, what is sweet grass? Where does it grow? Where do we get the quills? But we are starting to touch upon deeper issues. You know, we're, we're talking yeah. about um, our rights harvesting interactions with settlers when they don't like our activities. We're talking about, you know, the growth of our identity. And so we're really digging deeper, but in a gentle way. So people are able to come along this journey that I think that we've both experienced through quill work and not have to be vulnerable about it. You know, our listeners can listen to the podcast and learn and grow hopefully a bit as well, but without having things hit over the head in in terms of how they're learning their lessons. Part of the underlying message in our podcast is that what we are making is not just a piece of quill work that's art. What we are bringing to it is the reflection of our culture. And so I'm hoping that people, as they become more familiar with traditional Mi'kmaq quill look, they'll have an understanding of how much actually goes into it. At the end of each episode, Cheryl and Kay say, see you again in Mi'kmaq. Then we hear the call of the porcupine, the animal that's so important to their art. For CBC Radio, I'm Isabel Gallant on Lennox Island, PEI. Cheryl Simon and Kay Sark are porcupine quill artists from Ebigwit. Thanks to the CBC's Isabel Gallant for that beautiful story. That's it for Unreserved this week. This episode was produced by Laura Bone Stubing and Aaron Knoll. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild, coming at you from Winnipeg in Treaty 1 territory. Thanks for listening. Kinaskanimit Nawi, Egose. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.